in anatomy and physiology courses. Um, in the first chapter, it's introduced the idea that not only are humans complex, um, their complexity needs to be explained at multiple levels. We have a chemical level of complexity, and that could be chapter, say, two, whereas then uh, all these chemicals to, uh, come together and form a cell, and uh, the cellular level of complexity could be chapter three. And then cells and their products can form tissues, and then the tissue level of complexity can be chapter four. And then after this point, um, then uh, the course is ready to uh, introduce the idea of organs, which have multiple tissues uh, working together for a common uh, purpose in different systems. And from this point on, typically say anatomy and physiology one goes through certain systems like you know, the integumentary system, the skin, uh, the skeletal system, the muscular system, the nervous system, the endocrine system, um, and then anatomy and physiology too would then uh, pick up with other uh, systems. So uh, at this point, anatomy students are often behind, say, the introductory part um, because uh, chemical cells uh, and tissues, they need to be understood uh, for all uh, following uh, organ systems. Uh, and now the chapters then focus, say, on one organ system. And uh, the first one is uh, the integument. Now, a lot of people don't think of the skin as an organ, but the definition of an organ is simply multiple uh, tissues uh, functioning together for a common uh, purpose. So the epidermis, as we will see, is made of epithelia. The dermis is made of connective tissue and different kinds, areolar connective tissue here, a dense irregular connective tissue there. So that's multiple tissues. But then you add in that, you know, there are muscles which help the uh, hairs to stand uh, on end. Uh, there are nerves which uh, help in the uh, sensation of, say, touch and pressure. There are nerves which wrap around hairs. Um, and so all four tissue types are present in the integument and multiple kinds of connective tissue. So it certainly then qualifies as an organ. And as such, it is the largest organ in uh, the body, the second uh, being the liver. Uh, what I would like uh, to do is uh, to focus on uh, the um, uh, epidermis first, uh, the dermis second. I'll mention the hypodermis, not technically part of the skin, um, but just deep to it and so worth uh, a little uh, mention. Uh, the skin has a number of uh, functions. Um, it, you know, it, as we will see with the epidermis, uh, these cells will protect us from water loss. We'll talk about uh, nerves and various sensations, say, of touch and pressure and pain. So there's a role in uh, sensation. Um, melanocytes uh, and uh, other uh, things in the dermis contribute to uh, pigmentation of skin, of hair, of the iris, which not only uh, plays a part in normal human uh, variation, but also protects from ultraviolet light and thus uh, skin cancer. Um, we help regulate our temperature uh, because when we're cold, we can send blood away from the skin. When we're warm, we can send blood to the skin where sweat glands release uh, sweat. So uh, the skin has uh, multiple uh, functions. And with uh, that, uh, I'd like to begin with the superficial layer of uh, the skin, uh, the epidermis. Uh, so the epidermis is composed of epithelia. Now, this makes sense because epithelia line uh, the spaces which are open to the outside world. Here's obviously the outside world, and so we would expect epithelia here. We see that in epithelia, unlike other tissues, all of the cells are holding on to each other with junctions. We'll actually see the junctions better in um, uh, some of the upcoming uh, slides. Uh, so this offers good protection because you know, there are microbes um, which would like to go from this side of uh, the epidermis and get into the uh, deeper tissues and cause an infection. We certainly want to limit water loss, water going through. So these cells holding on to each other makes them an effective barrier. Because the outside world is a difficult one, um, these cells often uh, then uh, have to reproduce. Um, we're losing, you know, a, a million skin cells uh, per day, uh, and so therefore, you know, through abrasion, you know, through cuts, you know, through insect, you know, bites, etc., um, these can be damaged. And so you see, it's a stratified uh, epithelium. And although the cells are more cuboidal at their uh, basal uh, levels where they contact the 
uh, connective tissue, as they get towards the top, they flatten out. So this is what's known as stratified squamous epithelium. Now, um, <clears throat> at this point in the class, I very often ask my students, you know, turn around and look at someone in the class other than me. Okay, they do that. I say, okay, what you see is dead. And there's an awkward silence because even though we are alive, we usually don't see the living parts of us. Most of us have never seen our spleen. Um, that's okay. Most of us have never seen our gallbladder. Most of us have never seen our common carotid artery. Now there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you know, even though we have these living cells, we don't see them. We see the stuff that's on the outside. And while some stratified uh, squamous epithelia are composed of living cells, so say that line in your cheek or your nasal cavity or your esophagus, for example, uh, those on the outer portions of your skin, as they reach the superficial layers, they undergo keratinization. So the cells die. And uh, throughout this process, they've been producing a lot of this one protein keratin. Keratin is what makes up most of my outer skin, makes up my hair, it makes up my nails. Um, in other vertebrates, uh, it uh, composes the scales of reptiles or the feathers of birds. So keratin is uh, the primary protein um, uh, which uh, certainly the land vertebrates use in their uh, integument. And so uh, uh, these cells then become these uh, dead interlocked uh, bags of keratin. So when we look at ourselves, we aren't seeing the living parts of us. We're seeing these dead cells. But that's good. They're supposed to be dead. Um, because if we want to stop bacteria, which want to infect moist living cells, what better defense than to surround ourselves with dry dead cells that these microbes can't uh, make through. Also, um, because these are dead, they don't have to be mostly water the way that living cells do. And thus we can retard water loss by surrounding ourselves by these dead interlocked um, bags of keratin, and keratin being uh, very water uh, resistant. Now, because bacteria could still try to um, uh, work their way in anyway, uh, we slough these cells off. Uh, and so you know, a bacteria on the surface uh, will uh, be lost. So every single day, we are losing um, uh, skin cells. We leave them all uh, around us. I very often tell my you know, students, you know, in 50 minutes, you know, when this class is open, you will leave. But part of you will stay because while we're sitting in our seats, you know, we're losing skin cells, we're losing hair cells. So part of us stays behind. Um, but then obviously it has to be replaced. So epithelia tend to have a higher rate of cell division than uh, many other uh, tissues. Now, uh, that's the major, you know, description of what happens in uh, the epidermis. Um, but uh, we could break the epidermis into uh, various uh, layers and uh, focus on uh, those. So um, uh, epithelia are avascular. They have no blood supply, which limits them. And that's one of the reasons why epithelia can't get too uh, thick um, because uh, after a certain point, uh, we would be missing you know, just oxygen and glucose that dividing as cells uh, need. Um, so uh, the only cell division which is happening is in the basal layer, the stratum basal, and then the next layer, the stratum spinosum, still can still undergo uh, some uh, cell division. Um, it is in the connective tissue of the dermis that the uh, blood vessels, uh, which supply oxygen and nutrients, et cetera, are located. And so um, that is why it is only the basal portions of the uh, epi uh, the epidermis, uh, which uh, can divide. Uh, there is a basement membrane, which separates epithelia from connective tissues, such as the epidermis, uh, which is epithelia to the connective tissue of the dermis. And if we talk about, say, skin cancer, um, you know, the ability of skin cancer cells to penetrate this basement membrane and thus spread through the body could mark uh, a significant point in what's called metastasis, where they uh, become uh, malignant. Uh, uh, tumors. 
And so this is where uh, the cell division is uh, very high. And when I talk about melanocytes in just a little bit, this is why melanocytes are injecting these cells with melanin to protect them from ultraviolet light. Like these nuclei, if they were to mutate, um, well, they're about to be shed from uh, the body. So in a sense, you know, it would have minimal impact, but it would be the cells at uh, the, the stratum basal uh, that need to be protected because mutations there, um, uh, you know, will uh, be durable. So here you can see the integument. Notice that it is an organ. We have epithelia in the epidermis. We have connective tissue in the dermis. And there are different layers of the uh, epidermis. Um, and the outermost layers are composed of dead keratinized cells. So all of these cells are dead. This then would be the stratum basal near um, the, uh, uh, the connective tissue of uh, the uh, dermis. And so, uh, you know, at some point, and then we'll go through the different layers, you know, these cells then uh, die. Um, and then uh, uh, that occurs in this stratum granulosum. Um, and uh, before going into the uh, stratum lucidum, which is present in uh, thick skin, and the stratum corneum, which is then composed of the dead interlock cells of uh, keratin. So once again, the stratum basal, uh, these are the cells of the epidermis, they're epithelial cells, uh, which are contacting the dermis. And the dermis is where we have uh, the blood vessels, um, and then also, you know, uh, structures which, you know, participate in touch, et cetera, and we'll talk more about that uh, uh, later. These cells are the ones which are most actively dividing. And once again, when we talk about melanin, thus it is these cells which need to be uh, protected uh, uh, with uh, melanin. Uh, once again, there's a basement membrane which separates uh, this epithelia from the connective tissue uh, beneath. Uh, once a cell divides in the stratum basal, it forms two daughter cells. One remains in the stratum basal where it will continue to uh, divide. The other one has about two weeks to live. All right, and then so about two weeks later, as it goes through these various um, uh, layers, it will die. Uh, and then it may be another two weeks before it is shed from the body. So when these cells uh, divide, uh, once again, uh, the daughter cells, which get pushed up, have about two weeks to live and then two more weeks before being uh, shed. And uh, once again, you saw here that it is these cells here, which are injected with the brown pigment melanin. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, later um, because we wanna protect them from the ultraviolet light, which could cause neighboring nucleotides uh, to stick together and thus cause mutations, uh, which could increase the risk of uh, skin cancer. So once um, cells uh, get pushed up uh, from the stratum uh, basal, they then enter the next um, uh, layer, which is called the stratum spinosum. Now it's named the spiny layer, um, but this is you know, kind of a mistake. Uh, it's certainly not uh, spiny, um, and it doesn't look this way in life. This is kind of an artifact of you know, the cells becoming slightly dehydrated um, in the preparation of slime. So epithelial cells, they hold on to each other to make a firmer barrier. And there are different types of junctions, like desmosomes, where the cytoskeletons of neighboring cells are uh, linked uh, together. And so here, you can see that here are cells, and there are desmosomes which link these um, as cells uh, together. And because the cells are slightly dehydrated, they've shriveled a bit, and then one can see uh, these uh, junctions. So earlier, you know, I in another video, I talked about the junctions of epithelia, and here you can uh, see uh, the epithelial uh, junctions uh, uniting these uh, sections together. Um, uh, these uh, cells uh, can still undergo uh, some cell uh, division, although it is in the uh, stratum basal that most cell division uh, occurs. Um, by the time cells are getting to the stratum granulosum, this is where uh, they will uh, die. So they're going through their final uh, stages of uh, life. Um, the organelles are going to disintegrate. And then by the end, it, you know, it's a dead uh, package of uh, keratin. Um, now, uh, we see uh, granules here. That's why the, the layer is named the stratum granulosum. Uh, there are uh, two uh, classes 
of uh, granules, uh, which we can see in, uh, uh, in this layer. Okay. So, um, oops. Uh, so, uh, so those are the, the lipids. Um, uh, so uh, among uh, the granules, uh, one uh, set are uh, made of uh, carito uh, hyalin, uh, which uh, will help the cells dehydrate and cross-link um, the uh, keratin uh, filaments. And then there are lamellar granules uh, which uh, contain uh, lipids. Uh, the lipids are hydrophobic, and this will uh, help um, limit the water loss which occurs uh, through uh, the skin. Um, but then also, and I'll mention this as we get to the outermost layers of uh, the skin, um, we want our skin cells to shed. Uh, and this process, these formation, um, and it needs cells to separate from each other. And so enzymes, which are released here, will remain in the skin layers and help with uh, that uh, separation of uh, cells um, later. So all uh, uh, regions of the epidermis have these first three layers. It is in the str stratum granulosum that cells are dying. And then after, at this point, they become these uh, dead interlocked uh, bags of keratin very thick skin can have another layer which is recognized, the stratum lucidum. Um, and this is due to some processing of the lipids in those lamellar granules uh, produced in the uh, stratum uh, granulosum. So it has, you know, a, a light, you know, uh, shinier uh, appearance, this uh, stratum uh, lucidum. Um, cells uh, typically stay about two weeks uh, in uh, uh, the body, this can vary between thin and thick skin, um, uh, as these dead interlock uh, bags of uh, keratin in the stratum corneum. And when they reach the superficial layers, then they are a shed in desquamation. And once again, the enzymes from those granules in the, uh, uh, in the stratum uh, granulosum uh, can aid in that. 90% of the cells of the epidermis are these keratinocytes, uh, which uh, are storing this uh, protein uh, keratin, uh, which makes the uh, skin then largely, um, uh, largely uh, water uh, resistant. So it's not waterproof. It's not that we lose zero water through our um, uh, through our skin, uh, but the presence of keratin limits. Now, there's a very interesting um, a type of cell uh, found in uh, vertebrates called a melanocyte, and I describe a little bit of its embryology. Um, and here I've uh, included melanocytes, uh, say, in uh, the skin of a, uh, a lamprey or a frog, um, and you can see how uh, these cells send out these long processes. All right, and so um, there were frog lamp, uh, melanocytes, or you can see a lamprey, um, but they almost look like uh, neurons. And you know, with the embryology of it, it is the ectoderm from the embryo that forms both the skin and the nervous system. So you know, they have a, a common ancestor. Um, uh, but here, uh, these cells spend, send out these long spindly fibers with the idea that they can then inject neighboring cells with melanin. So melanocytes are the cells which make melanin, but their goal is to introduce this melanin into other cells. They inject it into other uh, cells uh, so that it can surround the nucleus and the melanin can then protect the uh, nucleus uh, from ultraviolet light, in addition to just adding uh, pigment. Uh, and so as I change the focus here, you can see these are three-dimensional uh, uh, cells which are sending out their processes in all directions. And you can see the individual granules of, uh, uh, of uh, melanin. Um, so uh, lots of parts of the body can have uh, melanin uh, uh, in it. Um, you know, obviously not just the uh, cutaneous membrane of the skin, obviously the hair, the iris, 
Um, but then also we can notice melanin in other places, like in um, the vascular tunic of the eye is black because of the melanin there, which absorbs light so it doesn't bounce around our eyes. Um, even uh, in uh, the brain, uh, melanin is present. There's a part of the brain called the substantia nigra, black stuff um, there. Uh, but uh, here we have uh, melanocytes in uh, the epidermis. They make melanin and then their long processes extend into the keratinocytes, especially in the basal layer of uh, the epidermis, um, where they inject uh, granules of uh, melanin, once again, uh, which then surround the nucleus and protect it from ultraviolet light. So the more melanin that you have in your skin, so this could be because um, you have a darker skin pigmentation or because of exposure to the sun, you're, you, know, you have a tan and you're, um, uh, uh, this is uh, for uh, protection. Uh, so skin cancer is the most common uh, cancer in uh, humans. Uh, not a, a, a big deal, fortunately for me, but I've had it. Um, you know, if you catch it very early stages, where I was lucky enough to, uh, with, um, and then, you know, can simply be uh, removed. If not caught early, then it could travel throughout the body and cause uh, a malignant cancer, which could then be life-threatening. Uh, so uh, this, you know, melanin, once again, uh, is protecting us from, you know, uh, uh, you know skin cancer, which could potentially uh, take uh, our uh, lives. Um, now, uh, not only, you know, can one individual make more melanin upon exposure to the sun, but obviously as we uh, look at, uh, at different uh, populations of humans in different parts of the world, we can observe variation in how much melanin is put in uh, the skin. And this, you know, humans are not unique in this. If you were to look at, you know, different uh, populations of other you know, animals from, you know, the two species of chimpanzee to different populations of dog, you know, it's there. Um, differentiations, uh, differences in pigmentation is uh, common between populations and, and humans then are no exception. And so you can see that in some uh, human populations, um, uh, genes uh, cause the accumulation of greater amounts of melanin in the stratum basal, uh, while in other populations of humans, uh, and much less so. Now, uh, populations, you know, whether it be dogs or birds, you know, or humans, uh, vary, and there doesn't have to be, you know, an adaptive reason uh, for it. Um, but uh, the uh, differences in uh, melanin could have two uh, separate um, implications, which you know do affect uh, adaptations. Uh, and you know have some you know pluses or minuses. Uh, one is obviously the more melanin you have in this uh, your skin, the greater uh, the more protection you have from skin cancer. So there are individuals, and we'll get to this presently, who can't make brown uh, melanin. No, some are called albinos, but then some just have very fair skin and red hair. Um, they have red hair because there are two forms of melanin, a reddish form and a brownish form, and they can't make the brownish form. And those individuals have to be very careful with sunburns um, because uh, they are at a higher risk of skin cancer. Um, so more melanin gives more protection. However, if you move farther from the equator where there's less sunlight, um, now having high amounts of melanin in your skin might then affect the amount of vitamin D that your skin makes. Um, I know we think of vitamin D as something that we put in milk. Now it's true, we do fortify milk with vitamin D so that we can make sure that everyone has uh, enough. But we also make our own vitamin D from cholesterol. Um, but we uh, do that after uh, sunlight has hit the skin. And so some populations are at risk of not having enough vitamin D. If you spend a lot of time indoors and not outdoors, if people work in a mine or a building, especially children. So in, you know, centuries ago, children could work in as sweatshops. If uh, it's part of your cultural practice to cover much of your skin, um, then you need to supplement your vitamin D because you're not getting enough. And if you had a lot of melanin in your skin, and you were living far from the equator, 
uh, where the sun isn't as bright or may go, you know, months of a year where you don't get much light at all, then that could limit your vitamin D. So there might be an advantage then in having lighter skin as you move farther from the uh, equator. So once again, you don't need to find an advantage in you know, what's uh, just natural uh, variation between populations. Um, but melanin affects both um, the protection from ultraviolet light, um, but then also your uh, potential levels of vitamin D. So, you know, varying uh, levels of melanin in different parts of the world could also then have an adaptive value. Uh, so once again, uh, melanocytes uh, represent about 8% of epidermal cells, and they send out these spindly processes uh, which can then introduce um, uh, melanin into a neighboring uh, cell. Now, uh, there are uh, two different kinds of uh, melanin, um, uh, and thus the granules, uh, the vesicles, which have uh, melanin called melanosomes, there are two different uh, kinds of uh, those. The pheomelanosomes, they have a more reddish uh, form of melanin. And then the eumelanosomes have the brown to black uh, uh, pigment. Um, now, I just go into a little bit of uh, the genetics uh, of it, uh, where the um, uh, uh, tyrosine, which is an amino acid, uh, can be converted into uh, melanin uh, using an enzyme. Uh, now, Obviously, if we need this enzyme to make melanin, um, individuals could have a mutation uh, where this uh, uh, enzyme is non-functional or we make less of it. And so this could obviously affect uh, pigmentation. Um, all individuals in, uh, in humans uh, seem to have about the same number of melanosomes. Um, the difference is then in how active they are. So if you have the darkest possible skin, if you have the lightest possible skin, if you're an albino and can't make melanin at all, the number of melanocytes would be about the same. The question would simply then be um, how much uh, melanin are uh, you making? Uh, now, perhaps not as, you know, uh, so I have a few additional videos if, uh, once again, there are uh, there's interest uh, here, uh, but once again, there's a number of genes then which then control the balance and the ratios between making these pheomelanosomes, which produce more of the, the reddish uh, pigment, and the eumelanosomes, which produce uh, the, um, uh, the brown uh, uh, to black uh, pigments. So, you know, there are genes such as MSH, the melanocyte stimulating hormone, the melanocortin uh, uh, receptors, um, and so if you have mutations in these, you might not, for example, be able to tell melanosomes that would have become the eumelanosomes producing the brown to black uh, pigment. Um, you might then have uh, told uh, them to, you know, then become uh, the ones which produce the more reddish pigment. So you might have uh, then lighter skin uh, and uh, red hair. Um, uh, which would then uh, mean that you would have less protection from ultraviolet light and be at a, a greater risk of uh, skin uh, uh, cancer. Um, and so, you know, this is an interesting uh, genetic uh, question. You know, what are the genetics of the genes involved in skin color? And then also um, because melanin can give us, um, you know, brown uh, eyes uh, or variations in this could then produce less melanin giving us uh, you know, green or uh, blue eyes. And then when we get to hair, the same, I, I have, you know, some information here about uh, the uh, genetics of uh, uh, skin color, hair color, and uh, iris color, uh, if uh, you would like. Now, uh, the ancestral condition in all of these, the first species, that, or, or the first uh, members of Homo uh, sapiens, um, seem to have had uh, dark skin, dark eyes, and dark hair. So producing a lot of melanin seems to be ancestral for our species. Um, and then in different uh, populations, uh, then there have been changes in genes, which you know in some populations then have, uh, have changed that. Um, as some of these are, are shared, uh, but then for example, uh, Asians and Europeans, uh, their lighter skin uh, has to a large degree resulted from uh, different uh, genetic uh, changes to the ancestral condition 
of uh, making uh, more uh, melanin. So if about 90% of the cells of the epidermis are keratinocytes, about 8% are then uh, melanocytes, um, well, then uh, what's uh, next? There are two other cell types uh, which uh, are, uh, uh, which represent about 1% of epidermal cells each. Uh, one is called Langerhans cells. This is a class of dendritic cell, which you, know, you might discuss more in the immune system. Um, these immune cells are good for performing phagocytosis. They eat microbes. And not only do they eat microbes, they can wear parts of them and thus signal other immune cells. Hey, look, I just you know, killed this microbe. This is what it looks like. Maybe we should mount a defense against those. And so longer Han cells are immune cells of, um, uh, of the skin that are good at presenting and then there are uh, about 1% of the uh, cells of the epidermis uh, are called uh, Merkel cells or tactile cells. Um, they uh, uh, then secrete uh, neurotransmitters, which then affect sensory neurons in the dermis and help to communicate a sense of touch. And so uh, we perceive touch in a number of different ways. We'll get to that. Um, and, but one of the ways is that epidermal cells, about 1% of those, those uh, Merkel cells or tactile cells, uh, they uh, are distorted when you know, we feel you know, pressure and uh, they secrete neurotransmitters onto the, um, the sensory neurons. So the cells of the epidermis are keratinocytes, making 90% uh, uh, of the uh, cells, uh, melanocytes making about 8%. About 1% of the Merkel cells with help, which help with touch, and then about 1% these longer Hans cells, which are a kind of white blood uh, cell known as uh, dendritic cells, uh, which then participate in immune responses uh, by not only doing phagocytosis, but by presenting the things that they've eaten uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, to. Uh, uh, to other uh, immune uh, cells. I'll get back to this one. Um, deep to the uh, epidermis are then, uh, is the tissue, the connective tissue of the dermis. This is the thicker layer of the, um, uh, uh, of the skin. Um, we split the dermis into two layers, what's called the papillary layer. And it's named because of these extensions. So notice here, we have these dermal papillae. Where the epidermis meets the dermis, we don't have a flat junction. If we did, if you put your hand on a surface and push, it would be easy then to shear the epidermis from the dermis. But because they interlock like this, then they have a strength that they wouldn't otherwise have. So. Uh, the uh, epidermis and the dermis, they have this type of junction, which makes it stronger. And it is areolar connective tissue, uh, which is found in, uh, the are uh, in the papillary layer of the dermis. Here we also then have uh, lots of blood vessels, not only because the, um, the dermis needs blood, but remember that epithelia are avascular, so the blood vessels in the areolar connective, uh, the, uh, in the papillary layer of the dermis, uh, these blood vessels then supply the uh, epidermis as well. So once again, uh, there are blood vessels here, which are not only uh, supporting the connective tissue cells here, but this is those uh, cells of the stratum the cell, which are dividing very quickly. This is where they're getting their oxygen, their nutrients, et cetera, because the epithelia are a vascular. Deep to the um, uh, papillary layer is the reticular layer composed of dense irregular connective tissue. Once again, with my students, I'd mentioned this earlier, I, you know, I make the joke, when you were young, you had a relative who every time they saw you, you know, they would say, oh, you're so cute and pull this way, and the next time they would pull that way, and the next time they would pull that way, which explains why this uh, set of collagen fibers is irregular. In a tendon or a ligament, all of the collagen is going in one direction. Whereas here, you have one collagen fiber going this way, one going this way, one going that way, because you don't know where 
you need to have strength. Your skin can be pulled from uh, any uh, direction. So in the dermis of the skin, uh, the uh, thicker layer, the reticular layer, is made of dense, irregular uh, connective uh, tissue. And you can uh, see that here. So the epithelia of uh, the epidermis, uh, the areolar connective tissue of the papillary layer of the dermis, and then the uh, dense irregular connective tissue. And here are, here are uh, those blood vessels, that's all red blood cells. I had mentioned uh, here uh, those uh, blood vessels in the papillary layer uh, supplying the, um, uh, the uh, epidermis. And once again, I'm just you know, repeating that, that where the uh, epidermis meets uh, the dermis, uh, we don't want a flat surface or else you know, whenever you lean on your skin, it would be easy to you know, just shear the epidermis from the dermis. So notice the, um, uh, the extensions of uh, the dermis, these uh, papillae, uh, which is why it's called the papillary layer. And in uh, these dermal papillae, you would see uh, blood uh, vessels, uh, which would service the uh, epidermis. Now, um, at this point, oh, I'm sorry, that's right. Um, uh, the fibers of the dermis, um, uh, they can largely lie uh, uh, along certain uh, tracks um, and, uh, and uh, these dermal papillae as well. And, uh, and so uh, these could actually be visible on the surface of the skin as uh, lines. Um, and then also as, uh, you know, things like fingerprints, which, you know, can help uh, grip, um, uh, et cetera. Um, and, you know, a surgeon sometimes, you know, you know uh, can uh, concern themselves with the, the direction in which many of these fibers uh, lay, um, because if one were to say uh, perform a surgery, if one cuts across these fibers, then it would take longer to heal than if one cuts along uh, the majority of the fibers. Now, uh, deep to the uh, dermis is another layer called the hypodermis. Technically, it's part; it's not part of the skin, and I'm not describing it here as part of the skin. But as you can see, we can uh, accumulate adipose here. In this video, which is mostly not about the skin, you can see adipose can accumulate in a bunch of places. So here's visceral fat. There's actually different kinds of fat in the body. Uh, so here's visceral fat around abdominal uh, organs, uh, and um, different fat can release different hormones, uh, and so therefore have different uh, uh, effects on uh, health. Um, but here you can see that uh, just deep to the skin, you can have this subcutaneous layer of uh, adipose. Now, uh, in other uh, lectures, I'll talk about the health consequences of uh, developing uh, adipose. Uh, one of the things about this adipose is that it's under the influence of hormones, steroid hormones, um, and, though, and thus then is uh, you know, can contribute to secondary sexual characteristics. So, you know, when I, I'm, I'm teaching, I, I tell my class, you know, um, if I had, you know, turned my back to write on the board or something, and someone came in and, and dropped a, uh, you know, an envelope on the front desk, and I had asked then, um, who was it who dropped the, 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 the letter? Was it a man or a woman? Um, now, uh, obviously, you know, you, you can't uh, necessarily, uh, uh, tell, um, but most people form an opinion. Oh, you know, I, this individual uh, is a man, this is a woman. And then I ask, well, what part of the reproductive system did you see to form that opinion? And they would say, well, I didn't. And then, well, then how did you form that opinion? And, and they might say, oh, well, you know, facial hair or, you know, the squareness of the jaw. Or one other thing is where was adipose uh, deposited on the body? because everyone stores adipose in the uh, hypodermis. Um, but where we put uh, adipose is uh, affected by hormones. So there are a number of things which cause individuals uh, to differ, uh, males between uh, females. Here obviously I have you know, male frogs calling. We're focusing on the different uh, pheromones, which we'll get back to, uh, uh, secreted 
uh, in African sweatlands. Um, but one of the things that can make uh, a difference is uh, where adipose is uh, deposited. So um, uh, whether you're producing more estrogen, that was estradiol, the major estrogen, or more androgens like testosterone and androstenedione will determine when you put adipose in your um, hypodermis. Are you more putting it uh, in your abdominal region, which is where males tend to store most of their adipose, or are you putting it in uh, a, a more a global distribution around your body, so around breast tissue, on your arms, on your uh, thighs, uh, etc. Um, and so this is what's called a secondary sexual characteristic. Um, it doesn't directly affect reproduction. I mean, facial hair really isn't involved in baby making, um, but nevertheless, it is something which uh, can, you know, is on average something uh, that differs between. Uh, the genders and exposure to androgens and estrogens uh, can then uh, change the distribution of adipose in um, uh, in the hypodermis. So, if one were to you know develop a, a hormonal uh, problem, if someone were to develop a cancer, which changed uh, hormonal distribution patterns, if as part of a personal choice, uh, one. Uh, was uh, taking uh, hormones which are more abundant in the opposite gender, one would observe that your adipose deposition uh, patterns uh, would, uh, would then change. So the hypodermis uh, stores adipose, um, but where it stores adipose then um, varies. Okay. The integument is an organ and it is composed of what's called the cutaneous membrane, that's the epidermis and the dermis, but then also accessory structures. Accessory structures can be uh, uh, nails, all right? Nails are essentially flat claws, um, but uh, also then hair and a series of uh, glands. So this would be an accessory structure. Actually, let me end with glands, so I'll go to hair first. Um, This is going to be a quick overview of hair. Because of the amount of money that is present in hair, hair products, the care of hair, I mean, one could study hairs and the layers, you know, for, uh, for a very long time. Um, but this is going to be, uh, you know, much more superficial. A number of organisms kind of hair like bristles. Some caterpillars do, some spiders do, et cetera. Um, but hair, you know, true hair is uh, confined uh, to mammals. Um, uh, technically, each hair is an organ. So once again, if all we need to have an organ is multiple tissues, if that's the definition of an organ, then the shaft of the hair, that's epithelia, it dips down into the connective tissue of the dermis, and this area known as the papilla of the hair is made of the connective tissue of the dermis. There can be muscles attached, there can be nerves wrapped around it. So you can have all four tissues actually in the hair. Uh, so uh, each hair is technically an organ. Um, they, uh, uh, the shaft of the hair uh, ends at the follicle where their hair is formed. This uh, uh, dips deep into the dermis and maybe into the hypodermis uh, of the, uh, as seen in the previous uh, image. Uh, so it is epithelia uh, which makes up uh, the hair uh, structure per se, but it's in a, a sheath of uh, connective tissue, as you can see there. So once again, there are multiple uh, tissues um, involved. So this would be the epithelia forming the hair, but then you could um, see uh, the connective uh, tissue uh, sheath as uh, well. Once again, we could split it into more and more layers, the middle being the a medulla, uh, a cortex around it, and other layers. Um, you know, not perhaps uh, essential, uh, but once again, uh, hair is worth a lot of money. A lot of you know people, you know, uh, earn uh, uh, you know earn their living uh, working with hair and its characteristics, and so we could study it 
in greater detail if I want it. Um, at the base of the hair in the hair follicle, uh, there is this little projection of connective tissue from the dermis. Um, it's called the dermal papilla of the hair. And this has uh, blood vessels. Once again, epithelia is avascular. So these cells, which are dividing rapidly, we have to replace hairs that we lose each day. Uh, they need oxygen, they need glucose, but they don't have blood vessels. So it would be the blood vessels here that would um, uh, provide uh, that. And so there are uh, capillary, uh, capillaries uh, here in the dermal papilla. And the area right over this is called the matrix of the hair. This is then the epithelial portion where you have cells dividing to make the hair. You have melanocytes, which are adding pigment uh, to uh, hair, um, uh, et cetera. And the previous videos have gone through, you know, while melanin makes the brown to black pigment, you know, which is, you know, the major pigment in humans, you can alter it and, and make primarily only the red form of melanin or alter melanin to make it appear more yellowish. Or as we age, more air is incorporated into the hair, giving it, uh, you know, a grayer uh, appearance. And so there are variations in the, um, the color of hair. Now, um, there is uh, a muscle which attaches to hair that can cause it to stand on end. Um, and uh, if you have a question, what kind of muscle is it? Well, that's easy to test. Say, all right, hair stand up on end, go. And if they don't do it, then you know it's not skeletal muscle because skeletal muscle is under voluntary uh, control. Then uh, it uh, is a smooth muscle, which composes these erector pili muscles, uh, which cause uh, hairs uh, to stand on end. In other animals, this serves a number of functions. It can make a cat uh, look more frightening and thus you know, communicate uh, an emotion. Um, it can help, in, I say, a dog keep warm if your hair is on end. It's like putting on a sweater. You create this area of air that isn't exposed uh, to uh, the wind. But our hairs are so fine, it doesn't really uh, serve much of that function. So why do we still have hair? Well, obviously on the head, uh, it can protect from ultraviolet light. You know, if men become bald, they have to be very careful because now the sun beating down on their heads could then increase the risk of skin cancer uh, developing uh, there. Obviously, just in uh, you know individual variation as a you know a, a form of you know attraction, etc. You know, hair can serve a number of uh, uh, functions. Um, also, it, it's important in the sense of touch. All right, now. You know, I know we think of touch as, you know, big things, but think of how many small things we need to feel, like bugs, or right? like mosquitoes, like, you know, uh, ticks, etc. Um, many insects can carry diseases. And so if, you know, uh, I, uh, an insect or arthropod uh, dislodging a hair then allows you to sense it and, you know, to get rid of the the tick or the uh, mosquito. It actually might just have saved your life. Mosquitoes carry malaria, yellow fever, ticks can carry Lyme's disease, you know, et cetera. And so even uh, if it's not, you know, sensing big, large objects, there's a lot of little objects that we would like uh, to feel a touch from. And then also we'll talk about sebaceous glands in just a minute. Uh, and when these erector pili muscles stand on end, uh, they help to pump the erector pili, uh, the sebaceous glands, uh, and thus uh, cause uh, the release of the um, uh, of, of sebaceous glands. Okay, well, all right, I'll stick with this video for a second. Um, as mentioned before, there are different kinds of ways that a cell can secrete a product. So cells can make uh, vesicles, and then through exocytosis, release these vesicles. Uh, this is known as a merocrine uh, secretion. Um, but then uh, cells can also include parts of the cytoplasm as well. Uh, this is known as apocrine secretion, where there could be you know, vesicles made with uh, certain uh, uh, products um, uh, causing, uh, you know, and, and it's this plus uh, cytoplasm which is released. Or cells can actually die, like they fill themselves with a product, but then the cells 
die, and then the secretion includes uh, dead uh, cells, and that's what's known as holocrine secretion. So as we go through different types of uh, glandular uh, secretions, uh, there are different ways that cells can release products. And there are different than glands in the skin. So this is another class of accessory structure. Our skin is uh, composed of not only the cutaneous membrane, the epidermis and dermis, but also then these accessory structures, hair, nails, and glands. Um, one type of gland is called uh, a sebaceous uh, gland. They're most commonly associated with hairs, but they can open up onto the skin as well. And cells undergo division. They're called sebocyte stem cells. And then as they reach you know, the basal portions of the gland, then they start uh, to uh, proliferate and, and then uh, make uh, what will ultimately compose sebum. Um, and this is a type of holocrine secretion where what then gets released, uh, released from the sebaceous gland is not just um, uh, their uh, products, but also then, you know, the dying cells. So, you know, just the entire cells uh, contribute uh, to this. Um, now, uh, there uh, are uh, a number of lipids like triglycerides, uh, free fatty acids, uh, squalene, uh, wax esters, um, and these primarily are here to condition hair and skin. Um, uh, keratin is very dry and brittle. Some people know that because they feel I want to you know, condition my skin. I'll buy a skin conditioner. I'll buy a hair conditioner. The reason we do that is, um, you know, in, uh, in the United States, for example, uh, we bathe frequently. Now, it wasn't always that uh, that way. In many parts of the world, water isn't very uh, available. And, you know, in many times in history, you know, daily bathing was definitely not the practice. Um, but when we bathe, especially with soap and shampoo, we remove the, um, uh, the secretions of sebaceous glands, uh, but then our skin and hair could be dry and brittle. And so then some of us say, well, I'm going to add additional conditioner. Um, so what you're essentially doing is washing away the natural conditioner of sebaceous glands, and then you may feel you want to replace it. Um, but your body knows that keratin can be dry and uh, brittle, so sebaceous glands uh, make this, um, uh, this uh, sebum, uh, which uh, conditions skin and hair. Uh, once again, they're typically associated with hairs, and the erector pili muscles uh, having the hair stand on end can then squeeze the sebaceous gland and cause it to release this, uh, uh, this waxy, oily uh, sebum. Um, so here you can see a hair shaft and there's the sebaceous uh, gland. Um, during puberty, uh, androgens, which everyone makes, male and female, um, cause these uh, uh, glands to become more active. And then the accumulation of you know, the lipids here can result in acne. You know, so you know, accumulation of, of fatty acids, you know, et cetera, triglycerides uh, could form a whitehead. If bacteria infect this, this could then uh, form a blackhead as they utilize the, uh, uh, the lipids here as a food source. Um, estrogen helps to minimize uh, the uh, severity of acne. So here you can see a sebaceous gland alongside a, uh, a hair shaft. Some uh, sebaceous glands actually just open directly onto the skin as well, but the majority are associated uh, with uh, hairs. Uh, now, uh, before we go into other uh, glands, um, uh, sebaceous glands are found uh, throughout uh, the body, and there are uh, then specialized sebaceous glands that one can find uh, in different parts of the body, like on the eyelids, in the auditory canal, where uh, their secretions uh, are more waxy, uh, on the exterior of nipples, in the oral cavity, in the genital region. And so um, occasionally, you know, the infection of, you know, one of these, just like acne can cause these glands to swell, the infection of one of these uh, uh, glands or a blockage uh, might be, you know, something to um, uh, to seek uh, uh, attention uh, for. So there are different types of glands associated with uh, the skin. Uh, sebaceous uh, glands are 
uh, one of these. Now, uh, the glands we typically associate with the skin are the sweat glands, and the official names of those are either eccrine or sudoriferous gland. So if you speak Spanish, sudor is sweat. Um, so eccrine glands, sudoriferous glands, these are those glands which secrete uh, a watery sweat, uh, which help us uh, cool down. Um, and so, uh, you know, our body temperature is something that we attempt to uh, maintain, you know, and we can, you know, live in hot areas, or if we exercise, you know, we could potentially overheat. Now, um, when I say that we sweat to cool down, you know, my classes are usually not impressed. You know, they're a little bored, you know, it doesn't everything. And the answer is, well, no, right? Most animals don't. I mean, look at these dogs, right? So these dogs are cooling down um, by opening their mouths and losing heat through their mouths. Look at this bird. Why does this bird have its mouth open? Because it's trying to cool down just the way that um, dogs do. So most animals do not sweat to cool down. Humans are in rare company. Uh, we sweat to cool down, so do horses. Horses sweat to cool down. And then some animals do a little bit. Pigs do a little bit. Um, but that's about it, all right? So uh, sweating to cool, this is actually uh, an adaptation that makes humans unique. Humans can actually cool down faster than almost any animals alive. Why? Well, we have a, a unique style of running. Now, you may not be impressed because you may uh, think, well, you know, say a deer could outrun us, those four-footed animals. Yes, but then we have endurance running that the deer don't. They can outrun us for a little bit, and then we can catch up, and then they might run, uh, outrun us a little bit, and then we can catch up, etc. Humans can keep on running. I have no claim to, you know, being you know, any uh, above average uh, athlete, but I've run a couple marathons. What animals run 26 miles in a clip? Virtually none, like us and horses, but beyond that, seriously, what animals can run that long? And especially in hotter areas, you might think, you know, the deer, the antelope, you know, they're going to outrun the humans, but the humans catch up. And then the deer, antelope, they run away, and then the humans catch up. But humans can lose heat. We sweat to cool down. And a lot of these other animals, they simply drop of exhaustion. They are too hot to continue. And then humans can then walk up to these four-footed animals and then you know, prey on them. This seems to have been important for early humans. Our ancestors, once again, they evolved the ability to sweat. That actually makes them you know, kind of unique. Virtually no animals um, uh, can do that. And so this uh, form of running, this endurance running, where instead of you know sprinting for a short distance, we just run and run and run. Apparently, that was uh, you know a great advantage for early humans. And going along with that, these eccrine uh, glands, which uh, allow us uh, to uh, to cool, uh, uh, this you know is a great adaptation of humans. These eccrine or sudoriferous glands, uh, they stretch deep into the dermis and have long ducts. Once again, being exocrine glands, we expect to see ducts. Uh, through which uh, the watery uh, sweat is uh, uh, released. The ducts are kind of odd. They're made with stratified cuboidal epithelia. That's an odd uh, tissue that isn't very common in uh, the, uh, the human uh, body. So uh, those are the sweat glands that I think most uh, people think of. Um, there are others. So for example, there are um, what are called apocrine sweat glands. Apocrine sweat glands, uh, they release uh, products which the microbes on our skin break into odiferous things. So it produces body odor, right? Sweat doesn't have to have odor, but um, lots of animals, mammals particularly, then have special glands which cause this sweat to have uh, odor. Um, these odorants are primarily then intended to be pheromones, signals from you to other members of your group, telling members of your group about uh, yourself. So when dogs meet each other, they smell each other, and they learn a lot about the other dog. They certainly learn gender, 
right? But in females, they know whether uh, the other dog is in estrus or not. Among the males, they know, is this the male that tends to win all of his fights? Is this a male that tends to lose all of his fights? They can get information about how healthy the other individual is. When we're sick, our apocrine secretions uh, change. There's uh, actually uh, the ability to get ideas of uh, kinship. Uh, and so uh, even uh, humans uh, can do this. Now, I have read, um, that if you were to say, you know, have a group of people and everyone produces the, um, the shirt that you had slept in the previous night, you line them up on the, uh, say a table and you then go down the table and you grab everyone's you know, shirt, you take a smell, uh, which includes, you know, their body odor. And then if you had a ranking system, you know, this is the, the shirt that I find, um, you know, least pleasant. This is the one I find, you know, least unpleasant or you know, pleasant. Um, and then if you looked at cell ID badges, the sequences of MHC genes, we tend to prefer the body odors of those who are less closely genetically related to us. Now, why on earth would that be? Well, in the modern world, you know, if you were to start dating uh, someone you met in a class or in a bar or something, you know, that person's ancestors could have hailed from a part of the world thousands of miles away from where your ancestors uh, hailed from. Um, but uh, our uh, ancestors in the past didn't have that type of environment, all right? Most of our ancestors lived in small towns, small villages, small tribes, where they were related to almost everybody. But this might have then, you know, provide this, you know, chemical uh, preference uh, where they would have been less likely to date their closest relatives because they found the uh, body odor of their closest relatives less pleasant than the body odor of those more distantly uh, uh, related. Um, and so these pheromones seem to serve a number of, uh, of functions. Certainly they do in dogs. In uh, this uh, buffalo that you're going to see, not only is the male sniffing the female, but then actually samples the urine uh, to get a better sense of uh, pheromones. Um, uh, we humans, obviously, we don't uh, interact uh, this way. Um, and a, a main reason is that we have two senses of smell. One is here, that's the main one, and one is here in the vomer. But this one's broken. You have two senses of smell. One doesn't work. And this one is the one that in other mammals is primarily the one which is uh, sensing uh, pheromones. Uh, that grimace on the bison was not an emotional reaction. It was opening the channels to the vomeronasal organ so that the pheromones could be better uh, sensed. And so apocrine sweat glands seem to be an important way for mammals to communicate with each other. Now, we humans, we don't communicate to this degree, but nevertheless, we still make pheromones in our apocrine sweat, which these apocrine glands are primarily in our armpits, around uh, our groin area, and around nipples. Um, other animals have it in different places. So most animals do not have a concentration of apocrine sweat glands in uh, their armpits, for uh, example. Um, so we still do make pheromones, and we still respond uh, to it. Uh, we uh, do have slight preferences uh, for uh, body odor. Once again, it seems to be correlated uh, in part uh, to a degree of uh, uh, being related. Um, the uh, apocrine secretions of women change over the menstrual uh, cycle. Um, I have this image here because uh, apes like ourselves have uh, a concentration of apocrine sweat glands in their uh, armpits. Uh, most animals, uh, most mammals have them elsewhere. Um, uh, uh, but women who live together often find that their menstrual cycles come in sync. This is because they are picking up on the changing uh, pheromones and apocrine sweat and responding uh, uh, to it. Um, and so uh, once again, even though this vomeronasal organ doesn't work anymore, uh, and we do not get the same input from apocrine pheromone secretions as our ancestors uh, did. Nevertheless, apparently our main olfactory system is still picking up on some pheromones because it, it does have you know, some uh, role um, 
in humans. And there are a number of, you know, psychology, you know, tests which show that like if you're inhaling uh, pheromones of one class or another, that this can change your mood. Or if you're, you know, looking at images and, you know, providing some response, pheromones that you're exposed to uh, can then change your uh, uh, responses. Now, apocrine sweat glands are producing, you know, proteins and lipids, you know, onto the surface of the body that then microbes can change. Mammals then took uh, apocrine sweat glands and made some of them uh, produce even more lipids and even then more uh, proteins. And this was then the origin of mammary glands. Mammary glands which produce milk are obviously the reason that mammals have their name. So mammals have their name because of uh, mammary uh, uh, glands. Uh, the most primitive egg-laying mammals, they simply have mammary glands that say sweat glands. They sweat milk onto you know, their abdomen and the young lick it off of the uh, tufts of hair uh, in females. Uh, whereas in the live-bearing mammals, the mammary glands are organized uh, around uh, a central uh, nipple. Now, um, mammary glands are obviously very important um, not only uh, in the topic of uh, cancer and breast cancer, which uh, I uh, deal with in anatomy and physiology one, but also in the reproductive system in, in anatomy and physiology two. And I have a playlist of videos which then go through mammary glands uh, to greater degrees, um, how they form, uh, cancer risk, and uh, mammary uh, glands, the changes that they undergo in uh, puberty, um, the uh, then secretions which uh, are in them. And uh, milk uh, is so very important. Obviously, mammals get their name because of the milk which is uh, provided uh, as the first source of nutrition. There are proteins in milk, and I have a video on, on the proteins in human milk. There are lipids uh, in human milk, different kinds, and I have videos on the, uh, the different uh, fatty acids uh, in uh, human uh, milk. I have um, uh, uh, videos uh, here uh, on uh, the carbohydrates. Um, uh, we're getting a better appreciation of bacteria in the microbiome, all right? And so we have bacteria which live on us and inside us, and that you know, we're uh, becoming aware of how important this is uh, for, uh, uh, for health. And so it's actually um, uh, milk, which is the source of uh, many of the, uh, many of the microbes in the microbiome uh, for uh, humans. Um, and, but then um, milk is even more complex than that. There are actually even RNA molecules um, which then affect the uh, gene expression uh, in infants. So mothers actually are, are including molecules in their uh, milk meant to affect gene expression. And so I have uh, a number of uh, videos that go into uh, the various uh, uh, components, the hormones present uh, in uh, milk and others. Uh, and so a more of a topic for anatomy and physiology too, um, but if of interest, I could supplement uh, this discussion on the gland.